Welcome everyone back to CBE's online conference, Men, Women and God, not necessarily in that order. Um, I'm Amanda Jackson. I'm going to welcome Natalie Collins in a minute. But before that, we're going to just remind ourselves of CBE's amazing work and the fact that we're involved in a conference, and but during the year, they do all sorts of other things for which they need resources. So um, with expertise gained by creating three e-learning modules in collaboration with Fuller Theological Seminary in the USA, CBE is developing their own e-learning courses that incorporate CBE published content like blogs, articles, and videos. The courses are designed to serve as both an introduction and a starting point for in-depth learning. Accessible through desktop or smartphone, they can be completed in under an hour. Current topics include gender essentialism, and world changing women in the early church. And there's more topics to come. And it costs money to do these things. It costs about $13,250 um, each year. And that includes supporting the team's ongoing research and subscribing to an online platform that can help CBE create each e-learning course. If you want to help CBE strengthen its online education, you can give towards this new initiative. In your app, go to the community board for a link to donate. You can find all the information that I've just been talking about and more in the app documents under e-learning project. Back to the live sessions that we're having as part of this conference, I am really delighted to introduce Natalie Collins, who's going to speak to us now. Natalie is a gender justice specialist and a speaker. She also does lots of training on issues of male violence against women and wider gender injustice. She speaks to Christians, but also to secular groups and community groups and government about this important area. You can find out about her book and other publications in her speaker profile, as you can for all the speakers who are going to be on this conference. Her first talk is called Rebranding Complementarianism, and then there's a question mark, which I'm sure she's going to explore. Thank you so much, Natalie. Hello, everybody. Um, it's great to be here, isn't it? I'm like excited by this online conference business. We can all come together from all over. I don't know what time it is where you are, but it's uh, four o'clock in the afternoon here. And you can probably tell from my voice, I don't actually sound very well. So if we'd been an in-person conference, I probably wouldn't have been able to make it. And I was thinking, shall I do it from my bed? Because <laughs> I feel so ill. And I was like, no, you definitely need to be in your office. So um, thanks so much for coming to this session. Um, as, uh, thanks for um, introducing me, Amanda. I um, do lots of different work around men's violence, and um, most of that has um, been both inside and outside um, Christian context. So I have kind of one foot outside of Christian context, do lots of work um, with women who've been subjected to abuse. I train practitioners to run a course called the Own My Life course with women, and um, they then run that course. It's a train the trainer model. So I train them to deliver that course with women. And although, you know, um, the truth of freedom is within that course, it's not a Christian course that we have some Christians who run it. I've also written a course for young people about abuse and exploitation. I train practitioners to run that course across the UK. Um, though, if you're from outside the UK, we're very up for moving it outside the UK too. So um, the, the course for young people, I've written a course that um, is for kind of general young people. And then I've written a course that also looks at theology with young people from Christian context. So um, if that's of interest, do uh, get in touch. 
Um, I've written a book about gender aware youth work. Uh, it's a tiny little one. Um, in, if you're from outside of the UK, you might not be familiar with Grove books, but they're these little kind of 7,000 word books that explain different things. And so that looks like how can Christians create youth work that is really literate and aware of the um, around sexism and managing that stuff. And practically, how do we create youth works that are um, just and uh, liberating places for both boys and girls? And um, yeah, I am actually starting a PhD in October um, in sociology and ethics and my master's was in uh, trauma and theology. So yes, um, I um, was going to start by putting you all into breakout rooms. And um, one of the things that's the, the worst bit about online conferences is how difficult it is to connect with other people. So I'm like, let's do it. So I'm going to put you into breakout rooms with uh, like in threes ish. And then if you can chat with the people in the group, you probably have about four or five minutes. I want you to just say hi and, you know, kind of introduce yourself to the other people. And also maybe just have a chat about what would you define complementarianism as? Is it something that you have a lot of literacy? in that you feel really confident in is it are you just like I don't even know what this c word is <laughs> I've never heard it before um I, I and just to say like we have to make sure we spell complementarian is right because if we spell spell it wrong it sounds like we're all about complimenting one another and saying oh you look nice today no you look nice today so you've got to do it with an e not an i <laughs> so um yeah so I'm going to put you into breakout rooms just have a chat introduce yourselves and what your thoughts are about um, what complementarianism is. So I'm not going to get you all to feedback when we come back, but I will maybe ask you to put in the chat. So um, just, yeah, I hope that's all right. Uh, let's go. How many people, how many groups do we need? Like 25, oh, uh, 20, how many is that? I'm like, I've got to do the maths now to work out. You're right, there we go. Um, so you should all be able to go into groups now. I see there's a few of you that haven't gone to breakout rooms. That is fine if you don't want to go. I'm just hoping that there's nobody in a breakout room on their own because <laughs> everybody's left them. Let me just put them into there. That's the tricky thing with breakout rooms if nobody goes. If you haven't gone to a breakout room and you want to just have a think about um, complementarianism, just maybe write something on your piece of paper, have a conversation with yourself. Um, this is a great thing about Zoom and, um, and uh, do it coming to stuff because, you know, like the introverts in the room. And if you would like to say, turn to the person next to you <laughs> and chat about uh, this, people have to go speak to the person next to them. Whereas in Zoom, you can just be like, no, I'm not going to the breakout room and nobody, nobody minds. So. Hi, I got kicked out of my room. Can you help me get back in? I was in room one. Great, I'll move you back in now. Thank you. The wonderful world of technology. It's magical, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a room. Oh, is that you? Is that Coralie? Yes. Hello. Um, uh, did you arrive after we put people into rooms? Maybe so, because we have had trouble making this work. Okay, well, you are here now, so don't worry. Um, we're bringing them back from the breakout rooms in less than a minute, so don't worry about going. Basically, I asked okay. you to introduce... I'll just wait. 
Yeah, thanks. We ask people to introduce themselves to one another and just have a chat about how they define complementarianism. So if you just want to have a conversation with yourself about that. <laughs> um, and then, okay, yeah. I already know that. Great. You, there is a definite, a definite delay. Your, your picture and your words that I'm hearing are not connected at all. Is that on my end or your end? It's looking fine on my end. How about you, Annie? It's good on my end. I, th I think it may be your connection. It might be the speed. Okay. Yeah, often can, that's where it comes from. You might find if your camera's off already, then that's probably you could just um, just close your eyes so you can hear me but not see me, so it's not so irritating. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not only great advice. Sorry. <laughs> I liked the first session. Did you? Yeah. So I'll I'll wait. Thank you. Thanks. We're coming back in a minute anyway. Everybody is. So. I've just closed all the rooms, so they've got sixty seconds to come back. Some people come back straight away. Some people are too busy having a chat, and some people are terrified about clicking anything. So wait for it to make them come back. <laughs> I always used to think when people took ages to get back from breakout rooms, it was because they were having amazing discussions and then realized, no, they're all sat there frozen, terrified that they're going to do something wrong and leave the meeting. We're just waiting for everyone to come back for those who are um not back yet who are who are here and are waiting hi everyone i think we're back now i'm just going to put in the chat and um, there's a link to my website with all the different things that i've written for people who might be interested um and um, if you could put in the chat, how did you define complementarian? So for people who don't know how to add things to the chat, on the bottom bar, if you wiggle your mouse, the bottom bar will appear. In that bar, there will be a button that says chat. If you click that, a box will appear either at the right or in the middle. Um, and then you should be able to, where it says type message, click there, type a message, and then press enter or the return key, and it will let you send a message. So if you want to put, why, how, would, how did your groups define complementarianism in like a very short period of time? <laughs> we need to move on, but I just wanted to check what people's thoughts were in the, in the room. So uh, Kirsty's saying male headship in church and in marriage. I would say it's the idea that men and women have different roles that complement each other with men taking on leadership and women being submissive. It's really interesting, isn't it? Who gets to be in charge? <laughs> uh, so um, I didn't know the term until I found CBE. I would say it's the idea that men and women have complementing roles. Men and women are different and that is okay, but not if it means men are seen as better or as heads. A spectrum of influence for women to be under men. We mostly celebrated Leona's woman pastor. Great. <laughs> the movie's like, we didn't discuss that. We just did our own thing. Great. Um, we saw it as patriarchy. I've stopped using the euphemism. I call it what it is, patriarchy. We never got, um, got, we never got around to it. We just enjoyed being with each other. Great. Um, complementarianism means that male and female should work together based on gifts and talents. Um, Thank you, everybody. I know that there'll be other things that come up. Um, so in early days, positive step up from the hierarchical with men as head, but more as complementing each other. In the Church of England, some comps are okay with women being ordained, so long as they are not the senior leader, while other comps think women should not be ordained at all. Yeah, so there is this kind of broad spectrum, really. And those who are like, I just call it, I just call it patriarchy, because that's what it is. Um, are potentially um, like, you know, that that can often be quite difficult for those who see themselves at the really soft end of the complementarian spectrum. We were like, but we really like women and we let them do loads of things. So usually my concern is with the word let. <laughs> The minute we're letting women do stuff, it suggests a, a sort of sense of who has the power. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I think in, in terms of this conversation, somebody put something in the questions before the session. Um, well done for whoever found out how to do that. Um, basically um, asking what are we defining complementarianism is in, as in this session? 
And basically, we're talking about a, 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 a way of thinking, a theology, a practice that essentially says that men and women are equal but different, and that difference relates to different roles in society and in the church and in the family. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at. And, and that those roles usually mean that men should have more power than women, but that power should be used sacrificially um which is interesting isn't it because um for a for a faith for a theological um you know a christian faith believes that we're all sinful and i'm just like what makes you think if you afford one group of people more power than another they're all going to do something sacrificial with it seems a bit uh dubious anyway so uh, the the reason that I've been asked to do this session is that um, I uh, was involved in uh, attending a conference for an organisation called New Frontiers, and um, they were a UK based organisation, and um, they emerged in the kind of late eighties, early nineties. Um, they're reformed, and um, they were set up by a guy called Terry Virgo. Um, and they are probably the most well-known UK free church uh, movement that is um, complementarian. So there are other free church movements that are egalitarian and there's other free church movements that are complementarian. But New Frontiers it is a part of their core identity that they're complementarian um, and it is a kind of from on high thing. Um, the, the movement has shifted in more recent years um, in that it was very kind of centrally driven and centrally governance but it's been it's, it's been split up into different spheres and so you have some that have different theology perspectives to others um, and so um, they um, birthed something out of their movement um, and um, it was a conference called Think Theology and that was a conference and blog that articulated their theological views and it's now not something that is located within New Frontiers as a um, like officially but those who've been around a long time knows that it comes from the New Frontiers movement. And um, they did a conference um, back in 2018 um, about the future of complementarity. Um, and um, it was um, every year they do a conference and, and usually that conference looks at a book of the Bible or something. But this year they decided to do the topic. Well, the 2018, they decided to do the topic of uh, gender and theology. And the guy who um, is, is the, the guy who kind of leads that organization think theology and is a he's a new frontiers pastor called andrew wilson and so i decided to go <laughs> to this conference that was going to be attended by loads and loads of complementarian pastors so i um i turned up um at the conference ready for three days of like what's this going to be about i don't know um so um I should say, credit where it's due, um, one of the things that emerged in this conference was that as um, as they spoke, they challenged male privilege and they talked about power differentials and they talked about the challenges of uh, a patriarchal world. So, I mean, I couldn't get like, you know, hundreds of complementarian pastors to listen to me talking about male privilege and patriarchy. So, you know, like all credit to them there. Um, and and in some ways the conference is um is was seeking to move things forward for women so both of those things in themselves are not terrible um but and that's just caveats before i go on to talk a bit more about what actually took place in the conference and um, so my experience of the conference was uh it was about 70 percent male perhaps more um the women who were there were not in church leadership because they don't really let women do things but they were there because they might lead women doing things because you're allowed or children i always do wonder why you let you know if you're gonna say that women shouldn't really do stuff in the church don't let them near your most vulnerable lot you know don't let me the kids you need to have the men doing that teaching if you think that you know it's, it's not women are you know capable of teaching don't let them near the kids <laughs> have them near the ones who are the most seasoned christians you know <laughs> anyway so um so the, the it was mainly white conference as well and um, the main speakers were a guy called alistair roberts and a woman called hannah anderson they've never had a woman speak before and i don't think they've ever had one since um some people may be aware of hannah anderson's work and um, she's a woman who advocates um complementarian principles and um, but does so from a kind of progressive ish um approach and um i sat in the conference i'd sat sit next to different people each day and i'd have to come out as a feminist so like all the time so i'd sit next to somebody and go oh hello who are you how are you and i'd be like hi i'm i'm natalie i'm actually here as the like the the token feminist to find out what's going on and i was like recording every session and sending them to a friend of mine who's a philosopher who was like unpicking some of what was going on there 
And um, and what was really interesting to me um, personally in attending this conference was that those people that I spoke to, that I was sat next to, we went out for dinner one day and um, after the um, conference and I was sat at a table with three men who um, had never met a feminist before um, and uh, they, didn't, they didn't really know what to do with me. Um, and they were like, but do you think this? And I was like, no, I don't think that. They were like, oh. <laughs> but do you think this? And I was like, no, I don't. They were like, don't you think that men and women are exactly the same then? And I was like, mm, no. <laughs> and they were like, really? And what, so one of the things that personally struck me as I went to this conference was that actually complementary people who are Christians who hold complementarian theology rarely engage with anyone who doesn't hold that theology, particularly Christians who don't, who are egalitarian or who hold feminist values. So they see feminism as this secular thing that's evil and bad and terrible. Um, and then in their Christian context, they basically are not exposed to egalitarian thought at all. And so um, that that emerged across the conference in different ways. But it was fascinating to kind of be be the straw woman that they had never met before in their arguments against the things that I was arguing for, which actually they found out that quite a lot of them we agreed on. One of the guys at this dinner, he was like, he was like, oh, yeah, I agree with you on that. Oh, yeah, I agree with that on that. And then he got really desperate and was like, we must disagree on something. And I think he was really terrified that he was going to become an accidental feminist over dinner. <laughs> like, oh no, we must disagree on something. Otherwise I might be a feminist and I just didn't know it. So that was quite fun. But um, yeah, they were really surprised that we had quite a lot in common. And this um, this this conference um, was motivated in 2018 by a, by a few different things. Um, the, um, I'm sorry to mention the T word, Trump. And no, we just don't want to talk about it. But within in 2018, UK Christians and conservative and complementarian Christians were becoming more and more uncomfortable with the alliance that was growing in the US between uh, Trump um, and Trump supporters. So um, John Piper, John MacArthur, this kind of lack of criticism from US complementarians of Trump um, and and uh, and and some of the stuff around Black Lives Matter as well and around the the racial justice stuff that actually the kind of the right wing and the political allegiance to um, to the Republican uh, Party and um, that almost felt like it was becoming a religion instead of you know Jesus and, and that kind of thing and so um, UK complementarians in UK reform churches um, were becoming increasingly concerned about distancing themselves and a lot of these um, these complementarians and um, their churches and um, had um, seen these US theologians John John Piper um, and others and the Gospel Coalition had seen those um, those people and those those movements as something that um, resourced them and so they would speak very favorably about John Piper they would speak very favorably of Mark Driscoll up until you know it imploded <laughs> I went on to Think Theology's website the other day for something and there was a bit where they were talking about uh, something that Mark Driscoll said very favorably and I was like oh they haven't noticed that's there yet have they because <laughs> they would want to you know kind of erase their support for Mark Driscoll so um, yeah so there was this kind of sense in the UK in 20 2018 that the situation in the US and the the way that complementarian and reformed and 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 on the kind of right to some degree Christians were essentially aligning themselves with something that the UK Christian context was like this is horrific <laughs> and so in 2018 this conference was really a way of distancing UK complementarians from the um the the the, the movement within the US complementarian movement towards Trump and towards quite explicit sexism and quite explicit patriarchal ideas. And so um, also at that time, the feminist movement was um, it come after the Me Too movement. And so actually Christians are a bit like, oh, oh, right. So feminists aren't all evil. They've kind of like doing some things that are about helping women. Um, and so there was this sense that actually the arguments against feminism and the arguments against justice for women were harder to make when we had like a president talking about grabbing women's genitals. And, you know, suddenly it felt like, oh, you know, like, I don't know if people have seen there's a sketch. It's from a UK comedy show where they, the Germans, this, this sketch where the Germans look at each other and they go, are we the baddies? <laughs> and I think a bit like what happens with this, with this uh, conference and some of what was happening in the UK was the complementarians seeing what was going on in the US and seeing what was happening in terms of racial justice and justice for women. And they were like, 
oh no, we look like the baddies. We need to present something different. And so this, this, um, this conference was a way of saying, actually, we're going to set out what we think about gender and theology. And so there was basically three messages that they um, gave at this conference. Um, they said, um, men and women are different. They are not interchangeable. They repeated this a lot. Men and women are not interchangeable. And so that means that the difference um, um, between that, that, that difference between men and women means that the decisions that are made will be poor if only men are making them. So we need women, if we believe that when men and women are different, which is what complementarians kind of uh, is part of their brand, if we believe complementarians believe that men and women are different and they represent different parts of God, then if there aren't women in the room, then we're not really, we've not got God properly in that room. And so we need women there to, to help us and um, to make those decisions. However, regardless of that men are still responsible for doctrine discipline and dying first um <laughs> you know in persecution um so i mean i'm not sure how many of them in england the north of england were going to be doing a lot of the dying first but that you know that's that's irrelevant i suppose or maybe it's not so um so men are responsible for doctrine discipline and dying first so it's really interesting because they were advocating the sense that difference between men and women means that men and women need to be part of decision making unless it's really important <laughs> unless it's about doctrine or discipline or dying first which are the kind of these really crucial things then you know then it needs to be just up to men so it's a really interesting space to be in where this advocating that actually we should have women in our elder meetings we shouldn't they shouldn't be elders but they should be part of the decision making process and so um, I'm going to I'm going to talk about those three things and what the implications for some of that is. So the men and women are different bit. Um, so uh, the, the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood set up in the 80s and was developed along with complementarianism generally. I think this is one of the things that we have to be really, really aware of historically is that complementarianism in the, the way we understand it today was a response to Christian feminism. It's not, you know, the, one of the narratives that complementarians try to tell is that we were there first and then the Christians, came, the feminists came along and the egalitarians came along and they twisted what, what, what is, you know, kind of true. And um, that is not true. Complementarianism as a movement emerged um, as, as a response to egalitarian, to, to Christianity being egalitarian, and as a response to the fact that egalitarians and feminists were dominating, Christian feminists were dominating the Christian, the evangelical Christianity. And so, com and, and so uh, the, the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood was set up in response to the effectiveness of egalitarian thought and to say, no, we don't like this. And I think it's really important that egalitarians, we need to understand our history because otherwise complementarians can 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 rewrite the history that 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 we were as a response to them rather than actually they were responding to to christian feminism and egalitarian theology which was the was becoming or was the norm at that point and so um they they came to that basically the council for biblical and manhood and womanhood was was um developed to fight the success of christian feminism and their advocation of difference meant that they argued that men and women's roles are different men make the decisions women make the babies broadly i mean i, mean, I know they'd probably phrase it a bit differently they've got like whole things but essentially men make the decisions women make the babies and um the the speakers at this conference argued that um that men and women are embodied differently and um that our innate femininity or our innate masculinity flows from our embodied being and um and oh am i echoing let me just mute that person i was getting a bit echoey there so um and that for Alistair Roberts, who was the main male speaker, and people may or may not be familiar with Alistair Roberts, but Alistair Roberts um, is a, has got a really big brain. I, I was friends with him. He once knitted me some arm warmers. And I, because he had a big brain, I just assumed he was egalitarian until I realised, like, no, he's a really big complementarian thinker. And um, he's written a big book about um, men and women being different and stuff. And, and he was talking in this conference and saying that if people live into what God made them to be, the innate femininity and masculinity 
of men and women will emerge. And um, it was quite vague, really. But um, at the end of the conference, I asked him, what am I supposed to do? Because I'm living into who God made me to be. And the living um, into the fullness of who God made me to be. And what that means is I I'm, I'm do lots of leadership stuff. And in my marriage, I'm generally the person who's making a lot of the decisions. And my husband in all of his life, not just in our marriage, has definitely been called to be a supporter and to support the, the ministries of others. Uh, even when churches have tried to tell him he should be a pastor, you know, because if you're a man of a certain age and you kind of follow Jesus, that's obviously inevitably where you should be. Women, it's probably not. But <laughs> And so, and so I asked Alistair Roberts, like, if our innate, my innate femininity will flow, unless you're telling me that I'm actually not living in the way that God has called me to be, and I'm somehow um, not living out God's plan for me, then you must be telling me that femininity, my innate femininity looks like leadership in the church and society. And he didn't really have an answer because actually what emerged in this conference was so much of this was really theoretical and not really practically answering, well, what do we do if somebody's innate femininity causes them to be really good at preaching or really good at governance or you know, not making babies for instance and so um, this framing of the the complementarian view um let me just see where i'm up to i got a bit i got a bit distracted there with my uh, um Okay, so the, the framing of the complementary view, one of the things that has emerged from this idea of men and women being different and this kind of masculine innateness and this feminine innateness that just flows out of us is that actually um, God ordained um, men to have authority. And so men should use that authority in order to live sacrificially. And one of the things that is emerging, and I don't know whether people have come across this, but it's definitely something I'm coming across, is that it's an argument that it's basically just a mirroring of the, the feminist argument of male privilege. So feminists argue that men have, un, um, have an advantage because of living in a patriarchal society. And all complementarians are doing is saying the same thing, that m men have um, power that is afforded to them. And so they need to use it on behalf of women. I mean, so what's interesting is that that's an argument that's coming out of the complementarian camp is, well, feminists are saying men have privilege um, and we're saying that men have authority. It's just different language for the same thing. And it's not the same language because actually... God does not ordain men to be privileged over women. That is a um, that is a principality and power that is um, that is not of God. And so there is something really interesting about what emerges in this conversation if if complementarians start to try to utilise, um, well, I'm just talking about male privilege in a different way. So I think that's one of the interesting things that also came out. So the next thing, um, so after that men and women are different thing, um, we had the men and women should both be involved in the decision making. We should let women be a bit involved, just a bit. And um, only when it's not to do with doctrine, discipline or death, apart from that, you know. So, um, so basically what they were saying is we are introducing a progression of complementarianism that we're rebranding and calling complementarity. It's not long, no longer complementarianism, it's complementarity. And this complementarity offers a different approach. It says that women's difference from men means that God wants men and women to be, made, be part of the decision making. And what this was introduced as in the conference, it was introduced as a development of complementarian thought. So men and women are different, that's complementarianism. And now we need to understand that men and women both need to be in the decision making. However, it is not a development of complementarian thought. And this is why it's really important we understand our history. So Rosemary Radford Ruthers, awesome book from back in the day, um, Sexism and God Talk. And in that she talks about egalitarian anthropologies. And she talks about within those egalitarian anthropologies, conservative romanticism and reformist romanticism as two forms of this, the, the egalitarian anthropologies, the, the, the how they develop and what they think. And so conservative romanticism argues that modern society devalues women's roles within the home and that men should be rooted in the home and value the home before going into the world, that they kind of are purified through the home and then through women's, you know, 
you know loveliness or caring or whatever it is they become and um, they're able to then go out into the world having been rooted in the home and so that is an that is one of the egalitarian anthropologies that we see and then the reformist romanticism says that women's unique feminine contribution will make society better as women's unique feminine essence improves the world so that comes from an egalitarian arguments they may not be arguments that we now understand as egalitarian but that is um they they are two forms of e egalitarianism and so what's really interesting is um kind of 30 years after probably longer after rosemary radford rother wrote about um egalitarian anthropologies and what they look like there's a group of complementarians in England going, this is complementarianism, <laughs> that men and women are different. And because of men and women, women's, you know, feminine essence, it will make our decisions better. And that's what God wants. And because complementarians don't engage with egalitarian thought, don't engage with feminist thought, they think that they brought it up all by themselves and that it's something specially complementarian. Um, because the reality is you cannot make women's lives better without using feminist theory you can't if you want to make women's lives better you can't actually do it without egalitarian and feminist theology <laughs> and so if you discover that you're making women's lives better i can guarantee that you will look back and you'll find that feminists thought of it first <laughs> Feminist, off, and then I'm not saying everything that feminist, you know, kind of feminist theory has brought up is always useful. But what I'm saying is that, femi so I, I don't know how many people are familiar with, there's lots and lots of kind of definitions of feminism. But my definition of feminism is feminism is any time a woman wakes up and realises it's really hard to be a woman. And then she works on how to make it better for women. And the really big problem with that is that like women are half of the population and they're going to have quite a lot of disagreements about how women's lives are going to be made better, which is why there's always a lot of conflict. And so um, complementarity, as it was framed by this conference from complementarians in the UK, was basically e early egalitarianism, but arguing itself as complementarianism. And so I'm, I'm proud to say that the complementarians in the UK accidentally became feminists, but didn't realise it. They still don't think they have, but um, I, I didn't tell them. I, I mean, you know, so because they don't read feminist or egalitarian books because they don't engage with egalitarianism they don't know any feminists they don't know any egalitarians they basically came to this conference and thought it was amazing and this like was radically new ideas and i was like what <laughs> this is from like the 70s um, and so i think there's a really interesting thing about what that means for us as egalitarians and the role that we have in terms of making this information more available and we really need to know our history we need to know where we come from so that we can do that work and so um just a few other thoughts that emerged as um as i was at this conference and thinking through the implications of it one of the things was that this conference was highly conceptual and not practical at all and anytime anybody tried to make it practical they'd go no 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 we need to move it back into this other weird ethereal space so um like one of the men in the in the audience said what do I do if my boss is a man, but my boss's boss is a woman? Um, and I was like, oh, please tell me, <laughs> what do you do? And Alistair Roberts was like, no, that's that's just too theoretical. Can we go back to something more practical? And he didn't actually answer. So it's really interesting that almost there's this kind of switching of that's actually really practical. I think what you're talking about is something really theoretical. And one of the things that um, I think, I don't know whether I asked though, it may have been me or someone else may have asked. Um, Cause I was asking, every time there was an opportunity to ask a question, I was asking one. And um, somebody asked, um, and it would definitely be something that I would want to know is, given that they were talking a lot about the innate feminine essence and what the innate feminine essence boils down to is being a mother and that's what basically all of their examples were about motherhood and and so I you know like that's highly harmful problematic toxic and makes a really is very difficult for women who can't have children women who don't want children men who can't have children um you know many it, it's just a massively toxic thing to make this all about motherhood and um what the response was are you ready because this is i mean I, I it's so profound i don't actually think it makes sense she said um, what hannah anderson said was not every woman can be a mother but every woman has a mother the end <laughs> 
so every far every man has a mother too but i just so i'm not entirely sure so there was this sense that it, it, it ended up in this very kind of theoretical you know kind of thought place rather than in a in a kind of practical what does this actually mean what does it mean for a woman who can't have children if every time you talk about feminine essence you're talking about motherhood what does that mean in how do we what is the answer for women who don't or can't have children like what does this mean so I think that's one of the things that we need to think about is we need to remain in the practical all the time. We need to be offering practical solutions rather than kind of always being in the theory. The theory is important, but actually it's one of the things complementarians can't offer very much of is um, is around the kind of practical implications of this stuff, unless they want to be really sound, really awful. <laughs> like, you know, when they don't, they don't want to. So um, the, um, the, the other issue with this idea that we've moved from complementarianism to complementarity and um, is the idea that this is an evolution from complementarianism to complementarity therefore it's not a break from complementarianism so we don't have to reckon with the harm that we have caused we don't have to repent for all the women who've left the church because of our theology we don't have to repent for all the abuse that that has been um, perpetrated on on under the name of complementarianism because we're not saying that complementarianism is a problem we're just saying we're moving to complementarity and so because there's no wholesale rejection of actually this idea that men and god made men and women different and men should be in charge but women get to be part of the decision making now and because it doesn't acknowledge the harm of of the previous way of being that means that we can't actually um we can't see there is no space for complementarians to start owning the harm that they've caused because they're saying oh we just need to do a little tweak <laughs> rather than we need to wholesale like kibosh the whole thing and so I think that's the, that was something that was really apparent to me. And there was a woman who was on one of the panels at this conference and she was working in the Middle East and she um, was dealing with lots and lots of men's violence towards women. And she said exactly that. She said, we should be on our knees repenting for the harm that we've caused. Um, and I was like ready to like call everyone to their knees in the conference. And then the conference organizer did a nice little prayer and we all got on with the rest of our day and it was lovely. And so I think there's something about um, this risk because actually in lots of ways, I was really pleased that we were seeing a conference which was saying women should be more involved in decision making, women should have a role here. And, and for individual women and individual churches of the men who were gathered there, this will hopefully make a, a an actual practical um, lived reality difference to women in their churches. But on a kind of theoretical level, it doesn't require repentance. It doesn't require transformation. Um, it doesn't require us to, to really change. And I think that that is actually in the long term a bit of a risk. Um, however, given that this was kind of feminist thought in the 19, 1970s, I do wonder whether like 30 years from now, all the complementarians will like have done the journey, you know, that the feminists did in the 70s. The slight hope, maybe they'll all kind of move into a different space so so i think these are just some of the things that, that are reflections for me and i think you know what it really 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 brings home to me and i know i've said it already is that egalitarians need to know our own history we need to know where we come from and we also need to be really good at honoring the women who came before us and the men who came before us and and to keep holding on to that um and one of the last things I'm going to say, and I'm, I'm not going to have much time to talk about this, and it's a bit of like a thing that probably could have been a whole session in itself. But I think one of the things we really need to be aware of is that postmodern feminist notions of sex as a social construct have led to a situation in which complementarians can argue that they have the upper hand because they say that men and women are different. And the feminists say that there's no differences between men and women and the biology is a social um, is a social construct and so i think there's something and i know nobody wants to talk about this and i think we have to be really aware of what's going on but i think one of the things that's happening um in terms of postmodern um conversations around gender identity is that um that that essentially there's an argument that that we have moved to a place where kind of people's innate gender identity is um is the thing that makes them who they are and their biology is irrelevant um and there, there is there's lots of kind of theoretical um kind of positions that different people take but i think it's one of the things that complementarians and complementarian theology um is is reckoning with and is talking about that egalitarian 
egalitarians aren't talking about. And I think it's going to be a real challenge um, for kind of Christians if we don't have some way of talking about some of that stuff and building literacy about what's going on around gender identity discourses. And uh, I don't know, I'm just trying to look at our time. We've got about 10 minutes. So I'm going to just talk about it very briefly. Um, regardless of people's views on gender identity, it's actually really important that we have literacy about the different positions and that we're able to understand and have um, confident conversations around it. And, um, and, and as yet, I think egalitarians have failed to do that because everyone's really terrified. Um, and, and so I'm just going to go through a couple of things that I think are useful for people to understand. I'm going to use a PowerPoint. I don't want to do death by PowerPoint. So this, I've just saved it for the last like five minutes. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to share my um, screen now. So um, this is um, two different definitions of gender identity. The first is from 1964 and the se second is from 2016. So 1964, gender identity um, was defined as knowing um, the sense of knowing to which sex one belongs. That is the awareness. I am a male or I am a female. Gender identity seems to be produced in normal human beings. Um, the normal they're doing quite a lot of work, I think, by the following elements. First, the anatomy and physiology of the external genital organs, by which is meant the appearance of and, um, and the sensations from the external, visible and palpable genitalia. Second, the attitudinal influence of parents and siblings and peers, whether these consider a child a boy or a girl will ordinarily play an extremely important part in establishing and confirming the gender identity. And that was uh, from Robert Stoller, who's, um, this was the first definition of gender identity. In 2016, um, the definition coming from a gender spectrum, a trans education organization is that um, gender identity is one's innermost concept of self as male or female or both or neither It's how individuals perceive themselves and what they call themselves. And um, one's gender identity can be the same or different than the sex assigned at birth. Individuals are conscious of this between the ages of 18 months and three years. Most people develop a gender identity that matches their biological sex. However, for some, their gender identity is different from their biological sex or or assigned sex. And that second de definition is really where we find ourselves in lots of public discourses. And you can see there's a massive shift in 50 years between the first definition and the second definition. And what the second definition really does is it suggests the existence of a kind of secular version of a soul, there's the existence of this sort of sense of who I am, and that being a kind of gendered na notion of who I am. Um, and, and most of the time that fits with my biological sex, but sometimes that doesn't. And um, and so I think what we're seeing is a conversation about um, about the existence of, of sort of a gendered soul, which I think um, that there is there are four different ways of understanding um, uh, gender identity. The first is trans affirming, which would say um, that actually um, that this respecting somebody's gender identity is the most important thing. It's like it's a it's like their soul, and so we need to honor that. And the second position would be biological, um, sorry, medicalization. Medicalization would say, actually, this isn't really about whether somebody has kind of a gendered soul or not, but this is about the fact that people need um, to move to a point of well-being, a point of um, being healthy. And sometimes that will involve medical intervention. So where that's appropriate, we'll do that medical intervention. The third position is biological essentialism. And this would be the complementarian argument. And the complementarian or biologically essentialist argument would be that there are male and female souls. I mean, I wouldn't say it like this um but that essentially ma men have a man essence and women have a woman essence um and so but they always exist in biologically male and female bodies so a man has a man essence in a male body and a woman has a woman essence in a, in a woman body so there is a belief in gender identity but just two of them men and women and they exist in the same sexed bodies as the, the identity um, and so in some ways, there are some correspondences between the trans affirming position, um, which agrees with the, the argument that there is a, um, a, a gender identity, this kind of internal essence. Um, but actually, there's just a, a disagreement on how many there are and also how which people have have what um, and then the, the fourth position is a gender critical position which would argue that there is isn't is no such thing as a gendered essence that essentially your kind of body dictates whether you're male or female and everybody should just perform who they are however they want to so there'll be people on this call who hold different positions among those kind of four points I, I describe them as being the points on a compass and so understanding where our compass points is really important 
Um, but I, I think it's really important that we understand we need to be having conversations about this, regardless of where we find ourselves in, in this conversation. Um, because what complementarians are doing is saying, well, they're saying that essentially boy, bodies don't matter anymore. <laughs> and, and they will put, say, well, all, I, all egalitarians think that. And so we actually have an argument that's, that's um, much more superior, and much more biblical and much more theological. And so while that's not the main part of what I wanted to say, when I sat down with a group of complementarian men over dinner who were terrified that, you know, they'd accidentally become feminists and hadn't realised it, um, that's one of the things they thought that I thought. They thought that I thought that there was that men and women are exactly the same and there's no differences um, and so we had to have a conversation about maybe I didn't quite think that and maybe it wasn't quite as simple as that so um I know I've gone through I've like whizzed through lots of stuff and I'm sure you're like brain's a bit like Wah! um so um I um I'm gonna put you into breakout rooms for literally two minutes just to give you a chance for and the people who want to just stay in the room so they don't have to like you know kind of talk to people if you're introverted but the people who find talking useful I'm just gonna put you into breakout rooms for about two minutes um just to have a chat Okay, so I'm sure that you um, all have a lot of things to think about and um, yeah, I'm going to hand over to Amanda uh, <laughs> for the last word. Um, so thanks very much for being here, everyone. Thank you so much, Natalie. What a rich discussion. Well, not a discussion yet, but there was lots of comment in the chat and people are starting to get their brain juices working, linking Bible interpretation with practical ideas, but also that reminder that we need to know what we think and why we think it. That's really important. We can't just assume that, you know, give ourselves a label and not really understand what we're talking about. We need to be literate. And I, um, so thanks, Natalie, so much for taking us through so much material.